Hey, Walter Sorrells back with more tips for the knife maker. Today, the Drop Point Hunter. So, one of the founders of the modern handmade knife movement was a guy named Bob Loveless. And probably his most famous design was a small drop point hunter. I think to, to this day that design stands up as one of the most elegant uh, and effective knife designs of all time. So what we're going to do today is a drop point hunter that is, let's say, kind of inspired by the Bob Loveless design. We're not trying to copy the Bob Loveless design, but it's going to be a knife that's in that kind of genre. Now, the, the drop point hunter to me is one of the best basic fixed knife designs that there is. It's small, it's uh, pretty, you know, concealable, pretty easy to use. You can cut string with it, you can skin game, you can do a lot of different things with it, and it's not bulky and hard to carry. So I really like this kind of design, and I think you're going to have a lot of fun working on it. The knife I'll be showing you how to make today is what's known in knife making parlance as a stock removal knife. This means that it's ground to shape rather than being heated up and banged into shape with a hammer. Now my bread and butter is the hammer banging stuff, but every now and then I like doing something like this. I'm going to make this a pretty comprehensive how-to, so if you've never done any knife making, there may be some equipment and concepts here that you'll have to play a little catch up on, but the intent is to make it very accessible to the beginner. The knife will be a simple, fairly workmanlike drop point hunting knife made from stainless steel with a stainless steel bolster and a wood handle. It'll be a full tang blade, meaning that the steel runs all the way through the entire handle so that it's visible all around the handle. In the end, this knife will look reasonably fancy, but that's only because I'm using a pretty wood. I could just as easily make it out of a cheap, bland looking piece of ash or hickory or even micarta, and it would just be a good functional knife to throw in the truck or take out to the deer stand. So first let's talk design. I like the drop point hunter design. A drop point is a simple blade shape that drops a little along the spine as it comes down toward the blade. Hunting knives normally have fairly short blades, somewhere in the three and a half to five or six inch range. I tend to like hunting knives in the four inch range. So that's what we've got here. The handle's basically just big enough to fit my hand. Now let's talk materials. First, blade steel. So this design today is going to be made from stainless steel. I'll be using 440C stainless steel. This is perhaps the classic stainless steel for knives. Now, stainless is a somewhat relative term. Enough contact with corrosive material can make almost anything oxidize a little, but with about 1% carbon and about 16% chromium, this is a very stain resistant steel. If you're just starting out doing stock removal knives, this is a great steel to start with. Everybody these days is using BG42 and all these super steels, but 440C is still a good solid performer and it's a reasonably affordable choice, much cheaper than the so-called super steels. Additionally, we'll be using a bolster made from 316 stainless steel. Some steels can be heat treated to increase their hardness and some can't. 316 is in the non-heat treatable realm but it's extremely stain resistant, so the salts in your palm are less likely to cause it to oxidize. Finally, we'll be using a burl wood for the handle. I keep tons of different kinds of woods in my shop. Wood, even fancy wood, is comparatively cheap. This neat little piece of mesquite burl has been waiting for the right project, and this is it. So, let's get started. I'll begin by drawing the blade. Everybody has designs that appeal to their eye, and the great thing about making your own blade is that whatever design appeals to you, you can make it. As I mentioned earlier, this design is sort of a nod to the drop point hunter designs of Bob Loveless, one of the founders of the modern handmade knife movement. 
Now, nobody would mistake it for one of his knives, either in the overall design or in the technical details, but it's in that realm. Now I'll cut the steel on my chop saw. I'm using a piece of one and a half by one eighth inch thick 440C. I drew the design out on the blade just to make sure it would fit. You could just as easily cut this with a hacksaw. Straight from the mill, all steel has scale, that is iron oxide, lying on the surface. This stuff is actually harder than steel, so you'll need to get rid of it abrasively. I'll turn to my belt grinder. You could also use a bead blaster or an angle grinder and a flap wheel or whatever. This just happens to be my little thing. I have this ugly little gizmo with a bunch of magnets in it that I use to hold stock flat against the belt. Now be aware, if you're going to try something like this, if your stock is warped, you won't be able to do this very effectively because it's going to cut off the parts that are warped toward the plate and not grind the other part. So you'll get something that's not parallel. Anyway, once I've flattened it and gotten rid of the scale, I'll trace the outline again. Now, if you want to go into semi-production mode, repeating certain models over and over, you want to make the outline a little more exact but I prefer not to do the same design over and over again, so once I get the basic layout, I'll just tune it by eye as I go. Next, I'll drill a quarter inch hole right here. You'll see what that's all about at the very end of the video. I'll also drill a quarter inch hole for the thong tube. Here I go on the belt grinder. I'm using a 40 grit Norton ceramic belt. These belts are pretty expensive, but you can really whale on them and get lots more wear out of them than, say, cheap aluminum oxide belts. I like them for roughing things out when I'm going for maximum stock removal. Incidentally, if you don't own a grinder, don't despair. There's nothing I do in this video that couldn't be done with files. Check out my video about how to make a knife from a file for more information on that. So, while I'm grinding away, let's talk grinders. I've got a whole video on grinders that you might want to check out if you're in the market for a grinder. But, this is a Bader B3 2x72-inch grinder, one of the most popular grinders among knife makers. It's very versatile, featuring a number of possible setups, as you'll see. But there are plenty of other designs, some much cheaper. Anyway, right now I'm using the flat platen. Also, watch how I use the wheels on the top to radius some of the curves. I'll also use my 12 inch disc grinder to get some nice 90 degree edges. You can just as easily use the little grinding table on the baiter to get good right angles. It's really up to your taste. Once I've gotten the blank roughed out, I fiddle quite a bit to tune the design so that all the subtle angles flow well to my eye. Incidentally, if you're new to this, you'll see that belt grinders produce a ton of friction which can easily heat steel till it glows red. Notice that as the stock gets too hot for me to hold, you'll see me leaning over to dip it in a bucket of water to cool it down. Okay. Once I've got the blade blank pretty well laid out, I'll move on to the next thing. This blade will have a satin finish on part of the blade, so I'm going to go ahead and establish that right now, starting with 320 grit, then moving to 600 grit wet or dry sandpaper. I know in advance that the handle will be covered, and the blade bevel will be ground away, so the only part that I really need to be finicky about is this little crescent right here, encompassing the top of the blade, and this little section right here, which is known as the ricasso. One thing to be aware of is that you need to keep the blade very flat where it transitions from blade to handle. If you sand too aggressively in this transition area, you'll round things off or leave a sort of dip, and gaps will form between the blade and the bolster as a result, and that looks really bushly. I use machinist squares to check the flatness and make sure I haven't rounded anything off.
Once I've got this part all prettied up, I'll prepare my bolsters. As I said earlier, they're made from 316 stainless steel. Other decent grades for this purpose would be 303 and 304. 303 especially is much easier to grind and a little less hard on drill bits. But 303 and 304 are both marginally less stain resistant than 316. You could also use brass, you could use nickel, silver. This is really just a matter of taste. Of the three, brass is by far the most fun to work with, but it also oxidizes really easily, so it requires maintenance if you want it to stay shiny. First thing I'll do is flatten out the back of the bolster pieces. It's very important that this be super flat. If not, you'll end up with gaps between the blade and the bolster. I'll knock off the scale and rough out the side edges on my belt grinder, then finish them on the disc grinder. Be careful with the disc grinder. If you don't lay the pieces on the disc with a lot of care, they won't grind flat. It'll sort of roll the edges, and again, you'll get gaps as a result. This takes a little practice. Disc grinders also love throwing things around your shop, and you just have to get a feel for where your grinder's sweet spot is. Once I've established the flat bottoms of the pieces, I'll grind 90 degree angles on the sides. It's worth using a machinist square to check that your table hasn't shifted. If the table is set at, say, 88 degrees, which you probably wouldn't be able to perceive by eye, it wouldn't matter how careful you are, you'd end up with an ugly gap between the wood and the bolster on the handle. So anything where that 90 degree angle is mission critical like this, I always check for 90 with my machinist square before I start grinding. I'll also check to make sure that the two bolsters are parallel and exactly the same width as I'm grinding. A note here about symmetry. One of the big hallmarks of high quality blades is that they're symmetrical from side to side. If one bolster is bigger than the other, it'll look cattywampus. I measure them down to the thousandth with my digital calipers, but if you don't have calipers, you can put them next to each other and feel them with your finger, and that will be absolutely as accurate as these calipers in making sure they match. You can do any number of things with bolsters, radiusing them along the front edge, cutting compound curves or angles into them, whatever. Normally I would radius them, but in this case, we're aiming for a fairly simple design so we'll keep both edges of the bolster straight and parallel. One thing to be aware of is that once the knife is assembled, it's very difficult to do anything to the front edge of the bolster without the danger of messing up the blade's polish, because you're going to be polishing in a different direction, and so you'll leave abrasive scratches that go in the wrong direction on the blade. So, I'm going to go ahead and grind a little compound bevel into the bolsters using a piece of scrap wood as a jig. Then I'll clean them up with sandpaper, sanding them right out to 1200 grit. They'll get little scratches while I'm doing other things with them, but after this they'll only need a tune-up to look perfect. Once I've got the bolsters roughed out, I'll drill some holes through which I'll insert pins that will hold the bolsters in place on the knife. I'll position them on the blade exactly where I want them, mark them, and then drill the holes. Now 316 is kind of nasty on drill bits, so I recommend using some drilling oil to keep them from snapping your bit. I'll be using 1 8 inch pins, so I'm drilling 1 8 inch holes. It's important that the holes in all three pieces, the two bolsters and the blade itself, match from side to side, so the sequence I drill them in is important. You could drill them all at one throw, but I wanted to make sure the layout was right, and also it's kind of difficult to clamp them sometimes. In fact, you'll find getting everything clamped together correctly to be a big pain in the neck. It's really the biggest challenge in this drilling process. Here I am clamping the bolsters to the blade blank. Again, check for symmetry. If one bolster is even a few thousandths of an inch further forward than the other, it looks pretty bad. I just use a straight edge. If I have to do a little adjusting, so be it. In this case, I'm kind of whacking on it with a little bitty hammer. In order to drill these holes, I'll need to use a fairly small clamp, otherwise I won't have clearance for my drill chuck as I'm drilling. You'll see how that works here.
Another important point. Once I drill the first hole, I always put a locator pin through both of the pieces. If the vibration of the tool causes a shift of even a couple thousandths of an inch, it'll screw everything up and you won't be able to get your pins to pass through all three pieces correctly. A second locator pin will go in after the second hole is drilled to make sure that the subsequent two holes are clean. Now, at this point, you have a choice. If you want to, you can mark the exact shapes of the edges of the bolsters and you can grind the edges almost to their exact correct shape. If you're making production blades or blades where you're repeating the same designs, unquestionably you'll want to do this. For one-offs like I generally make, it's a bit more of a coin toss. I prefer not to trim too closely because it leaves me a lot more room to screw up. But there's still a pretty good argument for trimming them too, as we'll see later. Next, I'll drill a couple of holes through which the handle scales will be pinned. I'll be using these nifty little goodies called Corby fasteners. Their center shaft is 3 16 of an inch, so that's what I'll drill. We'll see more about how this works when we assemble everything. First, I center punch them to make sure the drill bit drills where I want it to. Then I drill the holes. Notice I've wrapped the part that I polished earlier with masking tape. You'll see me masking things throughout. This process saves tons of repairs and it makes the people at Home Depot happy because every time they see me coming, they bring out a forklift full of tape to sell me. Now it's time to grind the blade. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to my channel and check out my website, waltersorrelsblades.com, where you can find more of my work. You'll also find plenty more videos there that you can't find on YouTube with very, very detailed information about all aspects of Japanese blade making. Also, like me on Facebook at Walter Sorrels Blades. Now it's time to grind the blade. Everything up to this point could have been done by a trained monkey. A patient trained monkey anyway. But what we're going to do next actually takes some skill. Now let me point out that you can make jigs that will help you grind perfect bevels on your blade. But since I'm a masochist, I like to grind freehand. And frankly, if you're just starting out, I think learning to freehand grind helps you become a better knife maker. Before I start grinding though, I want to set myself up for success. As we've mentioned before, symmetry is important in handcrafted knives. So, I'll use this scribe to mark roughly where I want each blade bevel to terminate. By following these lines, I'll end up with symmetry in the blade grind. This isn't just a cosmetic issue. The more symmetrical the knife, the less likely it is to warp during heat treatment. Additionally, I'll paint the blade with machinist layout fluid and then use my calipers to scribe a target grind line. I don't need to hit this exactly, but it gives me a rough target. Anyway, here goes. First I'll establish the beginning of the bevel. Then I'll tighten up my angle a little bit and start grinding the bevel closer to its ultimate grinding angle. Here are the important things to look out for when you're freehand grinding. First, you want to keep the blade angle steady. 
hold it firmly in your hands, tighten up your arms to your sides, and let your whole body move from side to side. Don't stab at it or fiddle with it or change your mind in the middle of a grind. Once you get it in there, it's steady as she goes. Start at the plunge line, that's the little line here that defines the edge of the ricasso, and move steadily across the blade without pausing. If you don't use a consistent motion and pressure, you'll end up with an uneven grind line, and possibly with little waves and dips in the blade. Next point, and this is where practice makes perfect, you want to feather the blade super gently onto the platen until you feel that the blade is flat on the platen. You will not get this the first time, trust me. Nobody throws a perfect curveball or swishes a free throw the first time they try it. Practice makes perfect. If you just went out and bought your first piece of 440C and this is the first knife you ever do, I'd really recommend practicing on mild steel and you know make a bunch of blades and just throw the results in a heap. That'll give you a lot more skill and confidence once you start taking on this more expensive piece of steel. I try to put the blade edge itself on the belt, just barely kissing it, and then ease it in quickly until I feel the flat hit the belt, very gently, but also as quickly as possible. Once you have total contact with the belt across the whole bevel, then you put more pressure on the blade and begin grinding from side to side. You can either apply more pressure at the top or at the bottom using your wrists and thumbs. This will either advance the grind in toward the edge or let you climb up the blade toward the spine. Just keep working it, taking your time, looking at the blade, seeing where you want to end up and adjusting as you go. In my case, I'm aiming to make a very high steep grind. This takes a lot more skill than a short sharp grind. If this is your first time out, I really wouldn't advise you to try and grind quite as high as I do here. But my theory is that a knife is supposed to cut, and the higher the grind, the better the knife will cut. So that's what I'm doing here. Now, it's rare that everything will be perfect, so you just keep adjusting and adjusting as you go. Once I'm pretty close to those guidelines I was aiming for, I'll switch to my 120 grit aluminum oxide. Once I get to 120, I want to make sure my grind lines are nice and clean and symmetrical. After that, I'll finish up with 220 grit. Now it's time for heat treating. Heat treating, for those of you who are just learning about knife making, is the process of heating and cooling steel in order to optimize its hardness. 440C is hardened by bringing the steel up to about 1900 degrees soaking it for 45 minutes or so, and then air or oil quenching it. It's very temperature sensitive and you need specialized equipment. Or not. Because here's the great thing about stainless steel as a steel for beginners. You can ship it out to somebody else to do the heat treating, so you don't have to devote a big chunk of your shop to heat treating equipment. Over the long haul, if you really want to get into knife making, you're probably going to want to develop your own skills in heat treating. But when you get started, one of the great things about stainless steel is you can buy a piece of stainless steel, you can um, you know, shape your knife, and then send it off to a professional heat treater who can assure you that the knife that you're going to have is going to be hard, durable, and so forth, that it's going to have all the working qualities that you're looking for. With 440C, you want to aim for about 58 on the Rockwell C scale. Tell that to your heat treater, send off your knife, and a couple weeks later it'll come back to you in the mail, hardened and tempered, ready to rock. I heat treat my own knives, but there's no reason you have to. Okay, so let's assume your knife just came back in the mail. It'll now be hardened and tempered, meaning that it will be far harder than it was when you sent it in. It will also be covered with a small amount of scale. You'll need to use sandpaper to remove it. Again, only a small part of the blade needs to be cleaned up with any care. That little crescent encompassing the ricasso and the top of the grind line. You'll also want to use a heavy grit on the handle portion just so that the epoxy will adhere well to the metal. And then use 320, 600, maybe even 1200 or 1500 to pretty up the portion of the blade that will be visible.
Now I'll go back to the grinder and clean up the grind. I'm not doing anything aggressive here at all, just cleaning up the oxides and the earlier scratches. If I wanted to make a satin finish or a mirror polish, I'd run up through some fairly high grit numbers. But in this case, I'm not making a super fancy knife and the grind marks will be part of the aesthetic or the design of the blade. So I'll just take it up to 220 grit aluminum oxide using a nice fresh belt, that's key, and that'll give me a nice clear crisp set of grind marks. One thing to be aware of, when grinding before heat treating, you can grind like crazy, heat it till it glows, whatever, and you're not ruining the steel. But if you overheat the steel now, and you'll know because it'll suddenly turn blue where it overheats, then you've just ruined the hardness of the steel in that spot. So as you're grinding, keep dipping it in the water bucket and be especially careful near the edge. Once I'm happy with the grinds, a nice clean plunge line and an even grind across the spine, symmetry is good, all that, then I'm just going to quit. Next step, it's time to finish up the handle. I'll start by cutting four 1 8 inch pins for the bolsters from a piece of 316 stainless steel round stock. I want it to be the same as the bolsters so that the color matches and they just all blend together. The classic method of securing bolsters is to use solder. This makes for an extremely durable bolster, but it also leaves a little tiny line of solder between the bolster and the blade. This seems to have gone out of fashion and a lot of makers just use epoxy now. That's what I'll be doing. I won't just be trusting the epoxy though. I'll also peen the end of the pins, meaning that I'll flare them with a hammer. This will make it so that not only do I have a glue bond, but I'll also have a mechanical bond that will literally lock the blade to the bolster. I'm just using store-bought two-part epoxy. There are fancier epoxies that might be better, but good old Loctite has held up pretty well for me in the past. You'll need to rough up the surface of the bolsters and degrease everything with extreme care though. If you don't, the bond won't last for squat and your scales will eventually peel off. Okay, since this is 5 minute epoxy, time's at a premium. I prefer to use 1 hour epoxy, but this is just what I happen to have in the drawer today. Slower curing epoxy is a little bit stronger, but still, this is pretty strong stuff. So, I set everything out on my anvil in order, carefully planning the order of assembly. If I screw it up, or if I have to make decisions in the middle of the assembly, I'm likely to end up with the glue setting on me before I've got everything secure. Even if you're not using a quick set epoxy, you're still better off thinking everything through when you're gluing. Here goes. First, I mix the epoxy. Epoxy has a shelf life, just like lettuce. Fresh epoxy cures better and harder than old epoxy, so this is right out of a new package. Once I've got it mixed, I smear epoxy on the bolster with the pins in it. Then I put the bolster on. Then I put more on the face of the second bolster and carefully press it onto the pins. I don't want to go all crazy with the epoxy, just enough for a good bond. Now I push it all together. Using a Warrington hammer, also known as a cross peen hammer, I'll peen the ends on the pins. I want to make sure that I get a little bit of pin protruding from both sides of the bolster. If I do all the peening on one side and knock the other pin face into the bolster, there won't be enough material left on the other side to flare out, and so only one side will get properly flared. So I peen a little on this side, Flip it over, make sure the pins are protruding there too, and then I peen them. Flip, peen, flip, peen. I just keep flipping back and forth until I got them all flush with the bolster. 
I'm also making sure that the two bolsters are squeezed totally flush to the blade. Once I'm happy with the peening, I'll pop a clamp on there. Now don't clamp the snot out of it. If you squeeze all the glue out, you've got nothing left to stick. If the bolster moves much when I clamp it, that means I'll need to peen just a little more to close everything up. Next, I'll take some solvent and clean all the squeeze out on the blade side. If you don't, you'll scratch up your blade trying to remove it later. I'm using lacquer thinner because I'm hoping to grow an excellent crop of cancer in my brain. You may use something smarter. Don't go nuts with it though. You don't want the solvent getting in the glue joint and leaking all the glue out of the bolster. Just enough to remove the squeeze out, then clean it up and you're done. Now set it aside and let the epoxy cure according to the manufacturer's directions. Once the bolster's glued up, I'll clean out any squeeze out that I might have left on the inside of the bolster. Then I'll choose the prettiest part of my handle scales, cut them on the bandsaw, and then trim and square them on my disc grinder so they'll cover the blade completely. Once I've got them all squared up, I'll drill the pin holes with a 3 16 inch bit. You want to use the holes in the blade as a guide. Make dead sure that the face of the handle scale and the bolster are pushed up completely flush. If they aren't, you'll drill the holes in the wrong place which will result in a gap between the bolster and the scale. Tinker however much it takes to get this right. Then drill both the pin holes and the quarter inch thong tooth hole. Once you've drilled one scale, put the second scale on using the same procedure, then drill through from the other side. I like to keep both scales on, this way you know absolutely that that drill bit is going to go straight through those holes and therefore the Corby pins will be able to go through too. Again, great care has to be taken with positioning and clamping. You can't neglect getting the face of the bolster flush up with the face of the scales. Let's talk about the handle pins. I'm using what are known as Corby fittings. The basic idea is that you have a threaded sleeve or female part on one side and a male part that threads into it which is going to come through from the other side. You snug them up with screwdrivers and then you grind these big fat long heads off. That leaves a nice, clean, attractive, and extremely durable pin holding the scales on. Let's see how this works in practice. After drilling the primary holes with the Corby pin, you'll use a step drill to countersink the hole for the Corby fitting. What's a step drill? You can check out my recent video about how to make a step drill to find more information on that, but basically it's just a drill that cuts two concentric diameters of hole at the same time. And that's exactly what you need in order to seat the flange at the top of the Corby fitting. In this case, it drills a quarter inch hole for the large diameter and a 3 16 for the smaller diameter. The inner sleeve or post on the Corby fitting is about 330 thousandths inches long. So I'll need to drill down just enough so that the shaft of the Corby fitting will almost, but not quite, pass from one side to the other. This way, when I tighten the fitting, it will exert a small amount of compressive force on the wood, snugging it up to the tang. Don't undershoot too much though, or you can bow or tear the scales when you snug up the fittings because you'll be compressing too much wood. Now you're ready to glue the scales. Again, get everything laid out and ready to go. You don't want to be tearing your shop apart looking for one more clamp while the epoxy is setting on you. As with the bolsters, I'll degrease all the surfaces and maybe give them a final scuff with a heavy grit sandpaper. The rougher the surface, the more surface area there is for the epoxy to cling to. Incidentally, when you're using an oily wood like cocobolo, ebony, or rosewood, you actually want to use a solvent on the inner face of the wood too. This will help the epoxy to adhere better to the wood by removing surface oils. Now I'll slather epoxy all over everything and assemble. Unlike with the bolsters, 
I don't care if I put a ton of the stuff on and I get crazy amounts of squeeze out. I just want glue everywhere. The Corby pins are driven into the holes and then screwed tight. Here's how it looks after they've been screwed together. The thong tube is also epoxied and driven into its hole. Then I slap on a bunch of clamps. Make sure you clamp all the way around the edges and get everything sealed up nice and tight. Again, no gaps please. Also, don't over tighten those glue joints. If you squeeze all the glue out, then you might as well not use it in the first place. This epoxy fully cures in 24 hours. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to my channel and check out my website waltersorrelsblades.com where you can find more of my work. You'll also find plenty more videos there that you can't find on YouTube with very, very detailed information about all aspects of Japanese blade making. Also, like me on Facebook at Walter Sorrels Blades. So, now it's time to grind the handle. This is a slow, tedious process because if you overheat the metal fittings, you'll burn the epoxy. So you have to go kind of slowly. First, I'll grind down the pins and the thong tubes and peck away at the bolster ends until they're flush with the blade. As I said earlier, I could have ground the bolster ends down before assembly and made this a little easier. But I didn't, so I'm paying for it now by having to go quite slowly. Again, I'll start with the 40 grit belt, grinding all around the knife so as not to heat any particular piece too much. First, I just eliminate all the excess pin and bolster and thong tube material. Once that's over with, here's a very important point. Be aware when grinding handles with metal pieces in them that wood grinds way faster than steel. Of course, you already knew this, but here's the practical result. What will happen if you just blast away, not really paying attention to the effect on the wood versus the metal, is that you'll cause dips where the wood is and all the metal bits will kind of stick up, creating this wavy, dippy effect. Not good. So, what I like to do is run the blade down the face of the grinder. This will force the belt to engage all the hard steel bits on every grinding pass, preventing the belt from accidentally digging into the wood and creating a major dip. Basically, I just keep crunching away at this point. I'm intending for this blade to taper just a hair from the butt to the bolster, so I'll keep that in mind all the time. And I'm always trying to avoid overheating the steel and burning the epoxy. If I feel it getting hotter than I like, I'll actually smash the palms of my hands around the hot piece to absorb heat with my body. At a certain point, I'll also start to radius the handle a little from side to side. I'll do this by kind of rocking the blade. Be super, 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 super aware of exactly where your blade is with respect to the belt. If you rock the blade around too far and hit the belt with your blade, you just trashed your knife. Did I mention you need to be super careful about this? I'm making a fairly flat profile on my knife, so I don't need to get really aggressive with the radiusing here. If you plan to sell your work, it's always good to be aware of trends in knife making, and these days knives are getting flatter and thinner. Once I'm happy with the general profile, I'll start moving to higher grit belts. 
60 grit aluminum oxide, then 120, then 220. Then I start going to my Gator grits and my Trizac. I'll end with 6 micron Trizac to put a pretty good shine on the bolster and the pins. Be aware these high grit belts will burn your wood, discoloring the surface of the wood, so go easy with them. If it happens though, don't freak out, it's just a surface phenomenon and you'll be able to clean it off with fairly fine grit sandpaper later. As you're moving through the various belts, don't neglect to continue cleaning up the radiuses on the inside of the handle and to polish the spine of the blade. I'll also use my slack belt fixture to blend this one little pesky line on the inside of the handle. I'll do that piece at the end with the same fine grit Trizac belt that I used for the bolsters and the pins. I don't show it, but later on I'll go back and I'll clean that up by hand running very fine grit sandpaper longitudinally down that little piece of the tang. For various reasons, the Trizac belt won't leave a dead perfect surface. So the final step, and this is a matter of personal taste, is to finish the bolster using either sandpaper or a buffer. I'm not the world's biggest fan of knives that look like bumpers off of 59 Cadillac, so I'll give it a sort of soft semi-gloss shine using 1500 grit sandpaper. You can't just scrub away though. You have to do the final finish in long, smooth, overlapping strokes or you'll leave ugly sanding swirls. More masking tape, of course, so I don't contaminate the wood with a bunch of sanding debris. This would be especially important if you're using brass or nickel silver. If you get brass dust into the grain of the wood, it'll oxidize green and look like ass. At this point, all the joints between the steel and the wood should be imperceptible, both to my eyes and to my fingers. If that joint between the wood and the steel bolster is still uneven, in other words, if the wood is higher or lower than the bolster, drop back a few steps and fix it. Or, cover your head with a sturdy plastic bag, put a gun in your mouth, and erase the madness of knife making from your brain. Okay, all that's left to do is finish the wood. I'll start by saying that I highly encourage you to try lots of different wood finishes. Everybody's taste is not the same, so find what you like and then refine your techniques to get the most out of it. The reason I say that is I'll make a confession here about knife handle finishes. I have never been 100% happy with any knife handle finish ever. On a wooden handled knife anyway. Here's the issue for me. If you want to bring out the grain of some outrageous wood, the best finish, in my humble opinion anyway, is nitrocellulose lacquer like they use on high quality guitars. Aside from the health risks, complication of application, blah blah blah, I just don't like that slick, plasticky kind of finish on a knife handle. It looks great, but I just don't like the way it feels. And you could do this with polyurethane, water base, all kinds of other things, but I, I don't like any of those really. On the other hand, you spend the time and effort to put some sweet looking piece of wood on there, you want to show off the character of it as much as you can, and if you just dunk it in a bucket of tongue oil, you may obscure a lot of the detail. All that said, on balance, I still prefer oil finishes from a tactile perspective because they're a little grippier and more natural feeling. That's just me. So anyway, if I'm using an unfamiliar wood, and I almost always am because different pieces of wood from the same species or even from the same tree may not react exactly the same way as other pieces. So I like to test out several different kinds of finishes almost every time I make a knife handle. In this case, I tried tongue oil and it actually looked pretty nice. Sometimes oils like tongue and linseed can muddy a nice grain or darken lighter woods to an unattractive degree. This can be kind of awful on a light colored burl wood for instance. That said, if you're patient and take the time to build up a little sheen, you can get something pretty nice. In this case, as it turned out, uh, I'm using a piece of mesquite burl wood which is pretty dark and pretty dense and for whatever reason it just seems to like the tongue oil. So I spend a couple of days laying on a little tongue oil, letting it sit, then rubbing it off. This slowly builds up a thin layer of oil which will not be hard and reflective and shiny looking but it will give some depth to the burl and give a nice warm glow to the wood. There's really no rule about when to quit. Eventually I'll just lose patience and stop. It's amazing how many important decisions in my life seem to be made that way. 
So, patient's exhausted. I'll take off the masking tape, clean up all the tape residue, general gunk, excess oil, all the stuff that got onto the metal. When you're cleaning all this crud and goo off at the very, very, very end, be careful. You'll often have abrasives that get caught in all this gunk, so you want to scrub it off very, very gently, moving in the direction of whatever abrasive scratches happen to be on the underlying steel. If you don't, you might end up just kind of dragging some abrasives across the grain, and you'll end up with unsightly scratches that you just can't polish off. So let me make a general point here. If you're just making a knife for Cousin Larry, hey, a lot of the super picky stuff I'm laying on you in this video is really just a waste of time. But, if you're planning on selling your blades, one ugly scratch can really torpedo the value of a knife. So the amount of effort you put into cosmetics should really be based on what you plan to do with the knife. Last thing I do is sharpen the blade on the belt grinder then touch up the edge on my 1200 grit diamond stone to give it that last little bit of nasty. Nasty. And there it is. This is a knife that's half fancy, half simple using knife. If I wanted to make a true safe queen, I would have given the blade a hand polished satin finish at a minimum or maybe even buffed out a mirror polish into it. Well actually I would never in a million years give a mirror polish to a blade. Just not my thing. But you might like that look so if you do, hey go for it. Hey, we never talked about this little hole I drilled. This is called a Spanish notch. It's a sort of simplified version of a Spanish notch. Originally, I think they were intended for trapping your opponent's sword while fencing. But on a modern knife, what it does is it allows you to have a really clean, consistent sharpening line or sharpening bevel running right out to the very end of the blade, rather than having it sort of fatten and smear as it starts to get into the plunge line ricasso area. Neat little refinement. Just one of those fun little details that help dress up a knife. Definitely not mission critical, though. So, here are some takeaways from this project. First, stainless steel and stock removal are a great combination when you start out as a knife maker. You don't have to worry about heat treating. Let the pros do it for you. Spend your time and your effort and your money on designing, shaping, and finishing. Second, spending 10 or 15 bucks extra on a really nice piece of wood turns what could have been a very bland little knife into something pretty sweet looking. It's no more work, but it looks so much better. Third, bolsters are a pain in the ass. I'm just saying. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to my channel and check out my website, waltersorrelsblades.com, where you can find more of my work. You'll also find plenty more videos there that you can't find on YouTube with very, very detailed information about all aspects of Japanese blade making. Also, like me on Facebook at Walter Sorrels Blades.